And so um, this last piece is really a, a, a reflection of that, a reflection of, of um, what are the stories that we're grounded on. Um, recently, and, and I don't know, in one of the many intense Facebook articles that you find where people fight about politics, um, someone said that um, because culture does move faster than politics, we might have all these conversations about politics, but it's ultimately the conversations that are grounded in the experiences of people that will dominate the narrative that then changes the culture. And so instead of us um, continuing to, to only focus on like, oh man, we have all these problems, I want us to, to come back to this idea of the work that we are talking about today is about human beings is about people, everyday people that get up and brush their teeth and go to work and take public transport and have to feed their kids or have to feed their cat and have to uh, get up and rehearse or might have a knee injury and need to get their shoes and, and need to call their dancers to show up on time or have to prepare the lesson plan. It's the individual. And so it is my great joy to introduce the next part of this evening. We're going to hear the stories of three immigrant artists. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about their individual journey. And then we're just going to have like a dinner table conversation minus the dinner table. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is not more food. I am so sorry. <laughs> you know that I love food. Um, but we're just going to we're just going to talk about about that, about our humanities, about our story, and, and, and that that be what we leave with in order to move forward. Because the conversations that we had today are, are, are will be outworked when you go to whatever place of employment you have tomorrow, when you go to whatever thing that you're endeavoring in, that's where they will be outworked. So without further ado, um, I'm going to, uh, one moment. Um, I will encourage you in as much as you can to turn your chairs and or your bodies, whatever feels most comfortable to you in this direction. Let's um, let's do just a little kind of breathing exercise to ground us in this moment and place, and to kind of shift our energies a little bit. So if we can, uh, why don't we close our eyes if you can? If you can put both, plant both of your feet on the ground, and if your feet don't reach the ground, move a little uh, forward in your chair so that you're grounded. And close your eyes, and if you can think of uh, something that makes you feel grounded and at home, whatever that might be. It might be a place. It might be a scent. It might be a sound. And from that place, I want you to become aware of how you're breathing. Put your shoulders down in case you have them open tight. Let go of your tongue. Take a deep breath in through your nose. And out through your mouth. One more time, in through your nose. And out through your mouth. And this last time when we breathe in, we're going to make it audible. Just let it out. If you need to sigh it out, if you need to scream it out, whatever makes sense for you. So let's breathe one more time in. <sighs> so whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes.
just look around you, maybe make eye contact with a couple of folks in this room. We've shared a lot of space together, a lot of stories. And now I'm going to leave you with our story bearers and storytellers. Thank you, Alexandra. <coughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Kayvon Purazar, um, and I'm just going to dive into my story. Um, I was born in 1977 in Tehran, Iran, uh, just a couple of years before the Islamic Revolution, um, which, I mean, honestly, there, there are similarities between what's going on politically in this country that are, are glaringly similar to me um, than that time for another moment. Um, I lived in Tehran until I was six years old. Um, and just to give you an idea of what the, um, the social climate was in Iran at the time, um, th what the psyche of the people of that country, um, this was a time when uh, the Basij, uh, this is an, uh, a branch um, of the Revolutionary Guard, uh, they, through their propaganda and, and promises of martyrdom, uh, their work led to tens of thousands of young people, children as young as 12 years old, dying on the front lines. No training, just thrown into war, human wave attacks, suicide bombings, f um, you know, little kids that look innocuous. Um, this was in the psyche of the people at the time, and I had people that were close to me that died in war. I had family that tried to go over the mountains to Turkey, the snowy mountains, and ended up with gangrene and had uh, no legs after that. Um, and this is the environment that me and my family were in. My, uh, my parents are tailors. They, um, they owned a store on one of the main streets, and they specialize in lingerie, which was um, kind of a s stuck out like a sore thumb to the Revolutionary Guard. My my dad got harassed quite a bit. He got taken into prison quite a bit. Um, he never talked to me about what happened there, but from the stories that I've heard of other people um, that were taken to prison, um, and just his emotional um, and mental state after that, I, he got worn down. And he was n I never got to see him in his prime. He now has Alzheimer's, and I feel like I only s knew him in his decline to that state. Um, anyway, in this environment, my mom and I, and you know, we, as a family, decided we couldn't stay there. My dad stayed to settle his business affairs. My mom and I, um, we drifted from country to country, whatever country would give us a visa, we would Turkey, Cyprus. We ended up in London. My dad joined us when I was 12 years old. Um, and they just didn't want to drift anymore. Our visa ran out, and we just stayed in London as illegal immigrants. Uh, somewhere during that time, my brother, who um, was studying in the US, he was, he's 14 years older than me. He um, married a Puerto Rican woman, Marilyn, my brother David. Um, and he applied for green cards for us. And this is one of the um, positive things about U.S. immigration is um, you can uh, not only apply for your parent or your child, but you can apply for siblings as well. Um, uh, the only thing is those cues are vastly different. My parents got their green cards when, they when I was 14. I didn't get mine for another four years. They... When I was 14, they decided they were done drifting. They wanted to rebuild their lives, so they did come to the United States. Um, they didn't intend to leave me alone in London, but that was the outcome, the way things panned out. So I lived alone from 14 to 18. I was uh, living in council housing, um, mostly a population that consists mostly of white nationalists, a lot of white nationalist sentiment. Um, I got beaten up a lot by those people. I, um, I worked at a deli and the money I made I didn't go towards rent, it didn't go towards electricity, it went to drugs as a way to escape what I was enduring. The, um, 
and uh, also uh, <laughs> they s started to come after me to deport me. Um, I was getting letters, I was going to court for deportation proceedings, um, and at nights I would be in candlelight eating out of cans. This was the condition I was in. Um, and I was going to inner city school, and there was drama class in this school, and somebody pointed out to me that I had a little bit of talent. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. I, I, wanna, I could pursue this. And so I looked for a performing arts school. I found a public performing arts school, and what I found was that dance spoke to me. Um, and I put everything into dance. And dance became a kind of haven for me. It became a place uh, to also escape from what I was experiencing, but also a place to process some of the anguish and express some of the feelings that I was feeling. Um, I ended up getting my green card in the nick of time. I, I still have the letter from the... Um, it's the home, the home office in, in England, I forget where, um, telling me that they were going to take action, they were going to deport me back to Iran. But I had a letter proving that I was now going to be uh, an, a U.S. green card holder. Um, so I cleaned up my act, I stopped doing drugs, made sure I was clean so I could make it here okay. I reunited with my family. Um, and all this time, as I was feeling a foreigner in England, not knowing all the social cues, not knowing all the, the, the modes of behavior, the codes of behavior that I was supposed to be engaging in, uh, I came to California where there's a huge Iranian population and I was feeling even more that way. I felt like a foreigner among the Persian community. I had no framework for that culture. I, had, I left when I was six years old. And what were they going to do with this male dancer? They don't know anything about that. <laughs> so I promptly uh, came to New York. I was it's where I wanted to come anyway. This is one of the dance capitals of the world. I uh, studied at SUNY Purchase. I graduated. I went into the field. I performed and performed with uh, a wide landscape of amazing artists that work within these beautiful collaborative processes. Um, but the thing that I found that is that what I discovered is that I could have a home in my body. If I felt like a foreigner in England, if I felt like a foreigner with Iranians, that I didn't feel like a foreigner in my own body. What I discovered that if I saw my body as a home, and by seeing my body as a home, I could see it also as an ecosystem. And by listening and observing what was happening in that ecosystem, I could also try to practice equity and reci reciprocity. And that could be a place for me to relate to the world. And in that building of that consciousness, I could transfer that consciousness to the world around me. So that's kind of mostly the work that I've done. I, Of course, dancing, performing, touring, but also having a personal practice and developing that personal practice, cultivating it and teaching it in the schools that I teach and essentially building resilience, cultivating resilience, because I think we are going to need a lot of that in the road ahead of us. Um, that's the end of my story. <laughs> Thank you. Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Awairaka te maunga, ko Manako te moana, ko Lela Ulu toku tipuna, ko Ngākaiwai toku iwi, ko nō Tamaki Makoto aho, ko Lengia Lela Ulu Paulo uh, te mama, ko uh, Pascale Brown te papa, ko Felina Keke Brown toku ingoa, I'm from Aotearoa and whenever we 
begin, we always begin with a mihi or an introduction. So that was just a simple mihi or pepeha of my land and my people in Māori. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on Lenape Hoking land and I acknowledge the Lenape people. For me, migrating was an act of freedom. It was a privileged act in which I chose to come. I made the decision. I arrived in New York City after coming here on a holiday and I just fell in love with the city. I loved how big it was, how I could do, be anything, and basically I could fail without anyone noticing, which is not something that I could necessarily do in New Zealand. I wanted to be an artist and I wasn't sure how to do it. I've been here for five years now and I've learned a lot of things. Uh, like when you leave, you definitely leave a part of yourself behind. I'm half Samoan, half Pakia or Caucasian, and I've always felt in between. So moving was a deliberate act of othering myself. And even though I spoke English, there are still lots of things that are lost in translation, the scale of the city. It took me a while to just kind of become acclimatized. I didn't know anyone. I knew one person when I arrived. Um, and even today, I'm still learning things like state and federal funding, like just all these big structures. Uh, when you apply for a visa, you become more aware about borders, unseen and seen. Um, you get used to scouring whether things include you. So even this week, I saw two things I wanted to apply for, but I couldn't because I'm not a permanent resident. So I feel like as an immigrant, that's something that you're kind of doing all the time, just reading the fine print, like, does it include me? Uh, last year I wrote and filed for my own O-1 visa, and when it was approved, I didn't realize how much emotion and anxiety the act of kind of proving myself to the government and just getting all the letters, asking people, and it felt really dirty to ask for help and kind of the shame around that, and we don't really talk about the processes of what it's like to stay here. Um, but I just had to remind myself that if you don't ask, it's not an answer, and so that's a no. Um, luckily, I've built a good community of people including my sponsor, who is this great white guy who has a design studio in Soho. And last year I got a big commercial job um, and he made me renegotiate my artist rate three times the rate that I had asked and they said yes. So basically that's just to say that all emerging artists should have like a really helpful white guy on the side who kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> helps you. and. I was hoping that there'd be more white guys in the audience to just be like, you know, find a person of color and sponsor them. <laughs> but there aren't that many. Um, so uh, living here, I've learned a lot of things about myself. Um, it's given me a new relationship to my body. Back home I had a car and it's a really accessible city and I didn't really have to pay attention to my body, but living in New York City, it's a walking city and I kind of really had to think about how I inhabit my body and how I look after my disabled body. So my art practice has become more movement-based and I've kind of been exploring the way that my body disrupts spaces. Um, living in New York City, I also explored my queerness, which is not something I would have done in New Zealand. So I feel like being an immigrant, there's a duality of you leave things behind, but you also get to express or like find new things out about yourself. Um, this year I helped form the Alien Support Service and we're a collective of alien immigrant artists who meet monthly and we kind of draw and talk story. The idea is that this will be a larger network, but it's just so great. Um, the women that I meet with, they kind of know me in a way that other people don't. You know, there's that thing of being an alien or an, of being other that I think immigrants just kind of understand. Um, so I think that the way we use language is really important and I self-identify as an immigrant, and I think it's not a label that I need to use. I'm privileged enough, I think people don't necessarily think of me as an immigrant, but I want you to look at me and think of me as an immigrant. Um, I've had people say to me, um, you're just the kind of person this country needs, I hope they let you stay. So I want people who say those kind of things to think about that rhetoric and that kind of language of who's a good immigrant and who isn't and who gets to stay and kind of subvert that a little by kind of uh, calling myself an immigrant. Uh, my use of the word immigrant is also important too because it honors my history, the history of migration that's happened in my family. 
My father's a white sixth generation New Zealander and my mom's a first generation Samoan woman. And this year I found out that she was actually undocumented until I was age three. So there were all these things I didn't even know. And I was reading these letters that doctors had written that said no mother should be separated from a child in my own like files. And so it was really um, distressing to read that same rhetoric 30 years later in a different country as an immigrant. Um, so for me, the personal is political and my art practice is responding to what's happening uh, today and how it affects my intersectional identities. And I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for the sea of community and people that have helped me. So I just wanted to end on a Maori proverb, which is, he aha te mea nui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What is the most important thing in the world? It is the people, the people, the people. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Castillo. I am an immigrant, but I am not going to be talking about myself. I'm here to share with you a story that I've witnessed about the beauty of dance among the immigrant community. I am a social anthropologist who had the beautiful privilege of working with indigenous communities in Mexico for the past 17 years. And after more than let's say 25 years of many Latin American communities waiting for a change in the current immigration system in the US. People have become, become exhausted, helpless, not knowing when this will come to an end. Family separation is one of the most, most expensive prices to pay to come to the US for new immigrant communities. Living in this city and having your parents, your wife or your children back home and not seeing them for five, 10 years or two decades, it's heartbreaking and, and has many people in depression in New York City. That's how I get to know the communities that I work in Mexico. Mothers waiting for their children wives waiting for those husbands, far away in this dark hole that they don't know, which is how it is, the US, and not understanding how much it's been worth to give your life to the neoliberal economy model and not getting anything in return, or sometimes remittances that are not even worth to pay for the emotional cost of having your family separated. So I was reunited with a group of these mothers when they said, what can we do to bring our message or take our message to our children and tell them that we are, that we want them back, that we miss them, that their place is here, we don't care if they're poor. We have nothing to get a visa, we are poor, we, are, we don't even speak Spanish. And then we came up with someone and some way we came out with the idea of like, no, you're not poor, you're rich, you have a beautiful culture. Why don't we use our traditions to get a visa to be able to go to the US? These women, 60, 70, 80 years old, started to form a traditional dance group and a year later, they arrived in an airplane to visit to the loved ones in the US for the first time in after 20 years. This was a small group of eight women who came here to perform the traditional carnival dance from the state of Tlaxcala in Mexico. And that's how they reunited with the loved ones. After that, they went back to Mexico and they were welcomed as heroes. And they started to become more and more dance troops. And then they were like 10 dance troops that we came back to New Haven, Connecticut. And we were welcomed by the major who signed a sister city agreement. And the immigrant communities started to see that their mothers had this beautiful gift that they were given to them also and never used them also in the US. They started to dance too. They started to form dance groups to receive their mothers and honor uh, the, the, the visit of their moms. And that's how they we were able to start a festival where the children will be showing and welcoming moms with the dance. 
Right now, it's approximately 200 families from four states in Mexico that every year are traveling between borders through cultural visas using their traditional forms of dance and welcomed by approximately 500 of the children who also, by relearning the dance, have learned a way to bring dignity to their own lives. Last few months ago, we had the New York Land Festival, which is the festival that we have every year for this immigrant communities, indigenous immigrant communities. And 1,500 people attended the festival. And um, it's just beautiful to see how using your heart, your body, and culture has achieved what politics and debates and Facebook and uh, the White House and the Capitol seems like never been able to achieve. When it comes to culture, we are all equal. It's very hard for a U.S. consulate to deny a visa for someone who's proving to be the owner of that form of expression. And, and somebody who's not interested in, going, in coming to the U.S., it's interested in holding and hogging a children, a child, a husband, or a, or a son or someone they haven't seen in a while. And, um, and what happened is that after four years of celebrating this festival, now the children started to see their parents and their grandparents and meeting their grandparents, and they started to wonder, Dad, why haven't you shown me and you told me that you know how to dance this? I love it. And so what's happening is now these parents are sending troops of children to dance and learn to dance every summer down in Mexico. I, these are US citizens who are really intrigued and interested by what their grandparents brought. And now every year the festival happens in Mexico with children from the US learning and bringing the dance and see others dancing that same dance in Mexico. So uh, this is just to say, just like before me, my brother and sister said, uh, Dance culture is resilience. These are difficult moments. Feels like we are at pre-war. This is like a pre-war momentum. And now more than ever, we need to put our hearts out there. We need to be artistic. We need to be human and, uh, and, and go beyond what politics or institutional politics have shown us that it's the way to take decisions and, and embrace uh, art as the best way of building the breaches that we need instead of walls and, and bring the humanity that we are almost forgetting that we have and we are. Thank you very much. How about those stories, right? Let's give them a hand again. So um, I want to, I have no idea how to follow that, um, except I want to just, uh, my instinct is to want to pass this mic around and hear everybody's immigration story. Um, and even for, for folks that maybe um, they are not first or second or third generation, um, remembering that all of us that stand on this territory have an immigration story and we maybe um, just haven't heard what it was. Um, maybe there was a moment in our, in our lineage that that story stopped being passed down. Um, and so I invite you all to go back home and ask what is your immigration story? Find out from whomever you might be able to find out if there is anyone still living. And if there isn't, um, see how Google can be of help. Um, because we all have an immigration story, right? Um, first, thank you all. Um, I think I just wanted to, s to start by um, each of you being able to say your name, because we didn't introduce you by name. You all shared your wonderful stories. <laughs> Um, and so just a name and, and maybe something about your dance practice right now. Um, and really what this conversation is, is going to get at is um, how are we going to move forward? Like where do we want to go next? And I think, um, I you know, Marco mentioned in, in his story that um, 
going beyond these constructs, these political constructs. We live within them, they're very real, and like Keke said, the, the personal is the political. Um, but there, there is a force here in this room throughout this day. There's, there's a force and a spirit that's been present with all of us having these conversations, and, and, and it's palpably resilient and palpably ready to move into this next moment for our community, our dance community and our local community. So if you can just say your name, a little bit about your practice, and, and then maybe what do you think is next for us? What do you think is um, our, our role in moving forward in this conversation about immigrant rights and, and dance artists? I'll try. <laughs> <coughs> Um, so I'm Kayvon Purizar, and um, I'm a freelance dancer in New York City. Right now I'm working with IV Baldwin Dance, and I teach at the New School and uh, for movement research, um, and I make my own solo work. Um, to answer or your question, one of the things I wanted to touch on um, in my story, but, but I, I thought in this conversation perhaps, is... Um, to talk about the the role and significance um, affluence plays um, in in immigration, um, I my parents at a time they had the resources to put me through private school up until I was twelve years old, um, and I think during those formative years, like having a robust education, it actually gave me the ability to carve my own path and decide that I could do that. And that that's not possible for everyone. It's not possible for all immigrants that don't have those resources, that don't have that kind of education. They, um, many immigrants, immigrants end up being, or carrying the burden that allows people that are more privileged to live more comfortable lives. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we talked about this, like, these are people that have amazing credentials and qualifications, um, like doctors, architects that come here and end up carrying the burden and doing service work for people that are more privileged. Um, so that's one of the things I want to talk about as a potential way in it and move forward is to, dis to, to deal with affluence and to, to see it as uh, the problem that it is. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Belina Keke Brown, but you can just call me Keke because I know that's really long. Um, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I started out just doing drawing and then I moved to writing and now it's um, uh, also connected to dance. So I'm kind of weaving all my different art forms together. Um, and what's next? Um, well, I think this is a great start, like having this conference and kind of creating these networks um, and connections so that um, we're all resources, so I think, you know, you could talk to someone who could help you, and so I think if we think of ourselves as, like, little spider webs that are, like, connecting, um, that's, that's a start, and I just wrote, infiltrate the system, so I don't know, yes. but when you're talking about affluence, like, who gets to immigrate, that's really true, like, you know, I'm a privileged immigrant, like, I was able to come, and some people aren't. Um, but I think that there's a responsibility with that, is you infiltrate the system, and then you help other other communities and I think the commissioner was saying like which kind of immigrants but I think that's just part of your responsibility as a good immigrant and I don't mean it in that way I just mean as a human yeah um, well I did say my name Marco Castillo and, and um, I am uh, right now the executive director of the transnational villages network and we produce the New York land festival every year here in New York uh, moving forward, I think that we just need to keep infiltrating. I think that we need to just to keep challenging the institutional way of communicating our ideas through traditional politics and make art uh, a form of, of statement that needs to be honored, respected, and listened. Um, I think that actual words and traditional politics have taken it to the point that we are seeing ourselves right now and um, 
finding much more embracive and humanistic languages will bring us closer, even with those who right now we see as our rivals, our political rivals. I think that we all are feeling uh, fear and we can all come together if we explore different languages and art. It's p the perfect way to explore different languages. And just ending by saying, for every police officer, for every soldier officers, we need cultural workers, we need artists. And, and that's what we want to see in New York City. The, the amount of money invested still in, in, in security in, in New York Police Department or, or the amount of funding in given to mainstream arts in comparison what it's being invested in communities, it's still very unfair. And, and I think that and investing in culture is investing in a safer future for, for all of us and, and a better and happier community. Um, you all were, are kind of getting at it in different ways, but you mentioned um, in your story um, a personal ecology. You mentioned this practice of the body. Um, how do you think that dance makers, um, it, it different from um, other mediums of art, are uniquely positioned um, to, to for in movement making, and, and by extension then, um, in the movement of immigrant rights. How, th this, you, this practice that you mentioned, I think it's very unique to dance makers. Um, so how do you think uh, that, they, that plays a role? Um, well, what I've observed with uh, some of the dance makers that I've worked with and the collaborative environments that we work in, that there's, there's an attempt, there's, there's a working towards a different sense of hierarchy in groups uh, where sh their hierarchy can be shifting uh, rather than a pyramid top down that, um, that information for the group can be provided by every part of the group. Um, and, and, that, and that being the process to create, uh, create work, create dance work, but it's also a, a way of cultivating a kind of consciousness of how you work with uh, other agents, other units in the group that you're in. Um, uh, so in, in, a, in a way, like that's one way in which, in, in a fractal sense, um, you know, the personal can become civilizational. Um, and for me, the, the way I think of it in, in terms of the body is that, you know, more and more science is finding, you know, the re science research is finding that there, there's consciousness in places that we didn't think there was, that it's not just our cognitive mind that has consciousness, but like for example, we, our enteric nervous system, our gut brain, <laughs> there's 500 million neurons there, that's almost as much as a cat. And like we assign some kind of consciousness to a cat, right? Like we can listen to what it needs, you can, and respond to it. And I feel like the same with our bodies, the kind of, the ways in which we compromise our bodies, that we don't listen to our bodies. That's, these are ways that where we can build and cultivate a consciousness to listen, to be equitable, to be reciprocal, not always take resources, but give back. Um, th I feel like these, these are some of the ways that I, I, I think about um, changing. <laughs> Yeah, and to add to that, when I think about movement practice or or how a dancer and, and dance as an art form works, you're always working with space. Like, you're not working necessarily just by yourself. Like, if I think of other art forms, it, it feels a little bit more personal. But, um, yeah, dance is inherently about space and how you're moving and connecting with or without people. And so it just, I think that's why it lends itself to um, thinking about political organizing or... Um, I don't know. I don't know where that thought goes, but yeah, I just I think because you're you're working with space. Um, in Samoan culture, we have this concept called the var, which means a space in between, and um, the var is also about relationships. And I think dancing is about relationships and space, and that's why I think your ecology of of the body makes sense in in a personal way, but in a larger sense as well. And uh, the communities that I am part of and that I work with, movement, it's something not to be admired or seen as a public, but it's something that uh, it, it's something that everyone, that it's open for everyone. 
there's there's no such thing as public. Like everybody joins the dance, and everybody dances to express something that it's not uh, that cannot be expressed through words. And usually, move the movement of the body. It's a way of connecting with uh, the land, with your own selves, and with other human beings uh, in a way that again words are, are never going to be able to. And uh, it's uh, very absolutely social. And uh, for us, it's a, it's a constant reminder that in, in order to build a social movement, for example, in this country, we need to listen to our bodies and use our bodies to get closer to the other that we don't understand maybe in words or, or in ideas. And, uh, and this is what we need to explore as new forms of, of, of challenging the way of, of uh, building a society. Keke, you said something that resonated to a lot of people in the audience um, in your story. You said that everybody needs the white guy, um, uh, the white ally. And I know that that word often now gets thrown around a lot with a lot of the social justice movements, the ally or accomplice or, or whatnot. But recognizing that there is a, a, a race dynamic in a conversation of immigration, right? Um, there's a race dynamic and many related forms of oppression that are present um, in added to to xenophobia as as a real thing that that we're uh, combating. Um, how 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 do you think that? Um, how do you think that these different forms of oppression manifest themselves? And what are some of the things um, that as a community, uh, both immigrant dance makers and non-immigrant dance makers can be doing to dismantle some of these? Bam. We're just gonna solve all the issues of the world in 12 minutes. talked about this in in the calls so that's the first thing I think of um, mm -hmm. but like disability and immigration is not uh, is not um, something that people think about and like when I was compiling my O1 petition I was worried that the person who would read it would read that I was doing disability dance and and like I would be not able to I didn't count, so I was like sometimes worried about do you put disability in there, and so and I also think about that because I think to get a green card, I don't want one, so I haven't investigated it, but you have to get you have to do a medical medical uh, physical, so I don't know what that means. Like, do I if I wanted to get one, do I qualify um, with a pre-existing condition? So there are things like that, and I mentioned before, like New Zealand is this really utopia of greatness, but actually it has a really hard immigration stance towards disability. If you have a disability, you're just not included. There was this um, really well-known mathematician. He was like the best mathematician in the world, and he had was given a post at Auckland University, and so it's going to do all these great things for our country, but his son was autistic, so his visa was denied. Um, so there are things like that. So, you know, who can immigrate? Like, I can immigrate because I'm a privileged person, but also um, they haven't asked me about my disability on my O1, so I haven't been discounted. But, you know, that's what, when I think about borders, I also think about that, and, and I couldn't immigrate to Canada. You know, there are places that I couldn't go to, so, yeah. I don't know. Um, so this question of who can immigrate, right, and, and who gets to determine that. Um, we haven't talked about, um, when, when, when Marco and I were talking this week, he mentioned communities of origin and communities of destination. You said that phrase, and it, and it stuck with me, and I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, and, and that often what those relationships are between those communities are also a matter of, of answering the question, who, who, who gets who gets to move, um, and and why do they get to move? Um, I think we've tiptoed it, tiptoed around it throughout the day, but also recognizing the role that U.S. imperialism has um, in in the the stories of migration 
that that people are enduring, whether it's forced migration or chosen migration. Um, so my my next question is how how does this this idea of chosen versus forced migration um, play into how we are are speaking truth to power in this moment, um, especially given this current um, political climate? Um, as w when I share with you the story of this communities that I work with, uh, I was and trying to make the point that uh, what drives and pulls people into the U.S. is not only the promise of a better economic life, because many of the new immigrant communities are not able even to succeed financially, even the, the you know, the, the deepening uh, crisis in this country and so many other, uh, uh, I mean, just keeping them in the shadows, it's just very hard to uh, bring prosperity in, in New York. Uh, but one of the huge factors is it's the idea of being in a mainstream culture, being in the new Hollywood, being in New York. The, the, the idea of New York as a magical place is being sold in indigenous communities in Mexico. And that's why many of them like get themselves in the trip of coming to New York while forgetting their origin and trying to build a new identity for themselves. Many new immigrant communities live in denial of their own past and trying to uh, mimic the white mainstream culture or the idea of mainstream culture in New York. And what we've seen through the story that I told you is that people have understood that New York, it's made out of small communities, and it's a story of people embracing their local cultures, their history, and they learned that through their mothers who were not ashamed and didn't come to the U.S. to pursue or trying to mimic or trying to, to uh, pretend to be nobody but themselves and claim, uh, you know, uh, their children back. And so... If if working if we keep working and in, in that way there's n not going to be such thing as here and there but there's going to be more transnational communities where here is there and there is here if we honor and we embrace how to continue our community while being here in New York and how New York it's not that far away if if you learn from it and 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 you can also take it back to your community. Uh, I think that's uh, that's one of the futures. We become multicultural, become Spanish, English, and Nahuatl. Uh, we, we become urban, rural, and indigenous. We are in between. We are up north, south at the same time, and, and that's where we need to locate ourselves. And again, culture is the way, way, way to build that bridge between uh, one place and another. Um, while you were speaking, I had a question. Why do you think that migration happens of that forgetting? Is it like because that history is too painful or like, um, and it reminds me of something we talked about earlier in the week about migration stories and that first wave um, where sometimes the mentality is to assimilate and then the second generation is to integrate. Um, but so I just was wondering, w yeah, why you think that, f that purposeful forgetting happens? Sure, it's an excellent question. I think that there is a lot of pain involved in history. Uh, many people, uh, you know, uh, uh, see their own story as a story of oppression and, and see other stories as a story of freedom or liberation. And, and that's, that's a problem. And second, it's a problem of representation. If you don't see yourself represented in this image of success in Hollywood and you see other cultures, you might try to, you know, it's, it's just conflictive. It's educational. It's, it's how communities are, are being oppressed in their traditional beliefs and other external ideas and identities are being imposed or sold as better or as more successful 
that gets all confusing. And I want to repeat myself. Many people say, how can Mexicans migrate if they have such a rich country with so many natural resources? Because we've been sold the idea that we're poor and that there's nothing to be done in our communities. And, and in reality, while well, you see all this flow of Mexicans to the US, you see all this gringo minings going, miners going to the, their communities to, to take all these resources out, to get the water. You see Coca-Cola growing, so, so it's just twisted. Thanks. <laughs> um, I also want to talk about um, also dismantling this this myth of the American dream, and and not just from the communities and Im immigrants that are coming, but this this idea that uh, if you're already been here, if you had generations already here, that somehow you're entitled to that American dream, that there's some kind of sense of seniority um, in your your immigrants <laughs> family having been there for many generations and it creates its own kind of hierarchy and when when people feel like there are uh, policies that are being instituted where these people that just jumped the line and now are the head of the line they're getting to the american dream before like that that's the kind of that myth is creating this animosity and this this rift and these entrenched ideas uh, that that are facing off, and and I think part of maybe part of the solution is to dismantle that myth. And that often the American dream is a proxy for whiteness, right? Attaining the American dream is really attaining the the, the closest proximity to whiteness that you could acquire, whether that's um, through capitalism in the form of having a house and having a car. Um, but other, but but also just that that really it's it's a proxy for whiteness. Um, so we're gonna close, and and I'm wondering if there's one thing that we can have these folks take with them um, as a thing that they can do to support immigrant dance artists. What do you think that would be? I think it's um, learning more about immigration, but not in the sense of the media that we're hearing right now, um, but hearing just about, I don't know, um, if you're in an organization, just like learning what some of the visas are or, or something. Um, just I, I'm thinking more like small to big X. Um, so understanding uh, that there are different kind of visas is a, is a good thing and, um, uh, so in like an institutional sense, I think there are certain things that people can do. And then in a community sense, there are things that you can do. Um, like um, getting to know the people that you live in your neighborhood. Um, getting to, you know, if you, I live in Washington Heights. So um, thinking about who are the communities that are in your neighborhood and what are some of the rights that might be starting to be imposed on them and like if you have privilege and some power then trying to do that um go to some community board meetings i went to one earlier this year and it was i learned so much i want to go to more so i think there are like institutional acts that you can do and then community personal acts too and um yeah just kind of um more talking to people i feel like when i was going through my immigration people just don't talk about these things and so it becomes like a dirty little secret and so just kind of Obviously, don't ask people what like immigration status they are, but just I don't know if there's a friend who's from a different place, and I don't know things like that because it's not something that you can talk about, and it and can be quite anxiety-inducing. So, yeah, I think um, yeah, and if you are a funder or something, think about um, is there language where it's clear that someone could apply if they're undocumented or if they are. Um, on a different kind of visa or they're not a permanent resident. Just make those things kind of easier, but also just educate yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm recalling uh, our conversation last week uh, where a couple of words came up, um, othering or otherization. Uh, this, this idea, and I've had you know many conversations among dancers and dance artists 
uh, where we talk about the f you know funders or we talk about the science community and we say oh they don't see it they they they're not seeing it the way that we the the right way the way that we see it and this this idea that these other communities are other um, but I really believe in in every community no matter how other we think they are there are agents in those communities that are looking for change and if we write them off completely that we can't connect to those agents of change in those other communities so I, I guess what I'm suggesting is maybe think about who you see as other who you see is as wrong who's the wrong to your right and then look for connections with their community look for the people in their communities that are looking for change as well and let's make more networks happen with communities well keep dancing and dance with others dance those who don't dance like you or with you and 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 if you feel like you're going too high up don't forget those dancers who are dancing in their basements or the indigenous dancers they don't feel as dancers because they think that you are the professional ones. Go reach out to them, make them feel dancers also, and and uh, and join the movement. Join join the movement for for uh, uh, for the for the immigrant rights. Let's let's grow it, and 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 uh, your industry, your sector can be a great contribution. Can contribute a lot to the to a better future. Okay, well thank you so much uh, for your stories. Um, let's give them a hand. <laughs> There's no better way I think to, to end today's conference and um, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our fantastic volunteers, all of the people that you saw throughout the day um, supporting us, to the center, um, to the staff, and to all of the people that helped make today possible. And a special shout out to our researchers, uh, Julie and Mireya, who might have just left to the airport. Um, they were the, the two powerhouse women that put together all of the questions and all of the inquiries that we've been in throughout the day. Um, and so I just wanna thank them very much. And of course, to our Immigrants Dance Arts Task Force. It's a community of artists, dance artists, advocates, educators, um, folks across function within the field that have really been guiding us in this work and, and are really the, the, the heads of the sphere. Um, and so we will continue to stay connected to you. We will share updates on what's next. Um, all of the conversations that we had today will be reviewed and gathered by our researchers and compiled into a research report um, that will speak to our gatekeepers and to our community on how we can move forward. Um, and we will continue the conversations. I mean, this is really the beginning, right? Um, and so with that, I just want to say thank you and have a wonderful evening. If you, um, it would be fantastic if you let us know what your experience was like at today's event. We have post-event surveys outside and some of you might have already received them. Um, this helps us better prepare for the future and, and to bring gatherings like this together more often. Thank you. <laughs>